The recent protests by construction workers have frustrated many Victorians. It seems to have been an excuse for violence and disorder and a display of toxic masculinity in its purest form. These protests are also potentially super spreader events. Is it fair that our healthcare workers will be expected to treat patients who've actively defied public health orders? And is it fair that hospital beds may be potentially taken away from those requiring acute care? How do we manage this violence and how do we manage the risk to the community? Brian Smith, I want to go to you first of all on this. I know you've written a lot about what you see as a increasing political populism, some of the fear and anxiety of this age and, and what drives this. When you look at these protests, what does it tell you? Well, it tells us that we do have a small part of the population of Australia that are fed up and uh, really aren't buying in, I think, to the Australian project. Uh, and so that is a problem. Uh, so education, I think, is really, really important, being able to have a conversation with people. But Australia, you know, as the population has made a decision of how to deal with COVID, not everyone is happy about it. But clearly violence that we have seen is not the right way. And we have made a decision as a population and our, and our politicians have on behalf of us to say this is not okay. And so I do think we need to clamp down on it. Uh, we need to find a way to get, of course, to being able to open up as fast as we can. But ultimately, we want to do it in a way that's safe and doesn't end up uh, killing or uh, making, I would say, really bad health outcomes for thousands upon thousands of Australians. Yeah, and Brian, you rightly point out that the small number, but of course, the violence that we've seen, um, the impact that that has is greater perhaps than the numbers themselves. And Vanessa, Brian said something interesting there. He talked about education, communication. There are people here, apparently, amongst the protesters who are anti-vaxxers, who in spite of the evidence, in spite of the arguments, simply don't believe it. How do you communicate a message to people right now who don't want to believe what they're told? Well, this is an incredibly tricky time for many people, and whether you believe to, to be vaccinated or not, that's, that's your choice. The information is out there. However, the way in which we provide this information can be a little bit tricky and it's, it's, it's kind of time in Australia that we hit that refresh button on how we communicate in science and how we see science. And this might be one potential example, or definitely one example of that. But maybe we need to think about assessing how we provide this information to different demographics and, 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 and provide that through people who they can relate to. So maybe there's a minority of people that they might look up to and they'll, they'll see someone and if they have those people providing those key messages, that might be one way. But there are so many and we are living in a one in 100 year event. Mm. This is very tricky, but communication is key. And the good thing is Australia is providing information on why we should get vaccinated and there is a lot of information thankfully coming from overseas I and mean, we've got the the luxury of seeing countries overseas testing people as well as vaccinating people and there's huge sample sizes that yeah. us in australia can look towards to see if these types of new science is working lydia when you look at a protest like that and we often hear um concern about what could be super spreader events we've seen other protests and they haven't turned out to be that, but what did you take away from these protests and what potential risks there may be, given that Victoria is still going through this outbreak of the Delta strain? Well, uh, it's a very difficult question and dip it depends whether there are infected people in the crowd or not. If there are and if there are others who are not wearing masks and they are in the proximity to those infected people, they have very high risk of being infected. So yes, potentially events like this can be super spreaders. On the other hand, we are talking about events in open air, in open air dilution of the mm. virus is much faster. So therefore in general outdoors, the risk is much lower than, uh, than indoors. Uh, and an infected person during, during a protest would potentially infect somebody next to that person, but not the whole crowd. It's mm. not like an indoor space where one infected person can in infect the whole crowd. So that's, that's yeah. the reason why we don't see this many outbreaks during the protest. Yeah, and just on that as well, ABC has been able to report that there was a man at the protests um, who has tested a positive. He's in hospital um, at the moment as well, just to go to that, that uh, 
that, that issue that you raised there about someone potentially being infected. Well, there was one person there that we've been able to report who is infected. Um, Michael, Brian talked there about the Australian project um, and that people are not on board with the Australian project. But it does raise the question, and I think, you know, you're originally from the United States as well, what it raises questions about politics during this time and, and questions of personal liberty and freedom. I know in the United States whether you wore a mask or not became a political statement. But when we talk about an Australian project, when we talk about a, a joint effort in dealing with a pandemic, there are other factors as well beyond the health factor that drive the sort of protests we've seen, aren't there? I, I mean, I broadly think so, but I, I do think it's worth saying that this is a really small part of the population. Mm. Broadly, people are on board, and the best way to know is to look at the vaccination rates. In New South Wales, we're now at 84% first dose, which indicates that 84% of adults are on board with this project. We really end up talking about a small but very loud minority. And, you know, to some of the earlier discussion, um, yes, there is a need for scientific discussion, for education, for communication. But at the end of the day, we, we end up with a, with a virulent minority of people who are uh, either by choice or by, you know, their wiring immune to fact. And so we need to take a different approach. And for them, I mean, I, my, my overall view of this is we are the victims of the greatest intelligence operation in history, that misinformation is being weaponized against us. Uh, it's not all that secret, in, in fact. Uh, and this is uh, fomenting violence in a really tiny part of our population. Our job is to help those who are mm. interested in hearing the truth and mock endlessly the people who are unwilling to embrace the truth. Toby, pandemics um, in the past have seen just the sort of events we're seeing now, aren't they? They've thrown up just these types of protests. Yeah, um, history is in some ways repeating itself. Um, if you go back to the 100 years to the Spanish flu, there were riots and protests then. People were upset about um, mandatory vaccines and, uh, and, the, and the lockdowns that happened then. So um, I do think actually there's a strange... A uh, cycle of history that these happen once every hundred years or so. Mm. It's just long enough for us to have forgotten the lessons we learned last time, the, the pains that we had to go through, um, the sacrifices we had to make. That was something that our great grandfathers, great grandmothers had to live through. And now we've forgotten those lessons and we have to learn those painfully enough. And, and Toby, given um, what we're on the cusp of as well with changes, rapid changes when it comes to things like artificial intelligence, <laughs> might this be the last of this type of pandemic that we live through? I'm hopeful that this actually might be the last pandemic because we now... It used to take a decade to develop a, a vaccine. Um, this vaccine took a year. Mm. And that's unprecedented. But now we can develop vaccines. I mean, some, some of these vaccines, like the mRNA vaccines, you can develop in a, a couple of months. Mm. And so if we can learn how to distribute the vaccines, and that's not just to us, but that's to the whole world, and we haven't worked that problem out, because this pandemic is not over by a long way, mm. because we haven't really begun to vaccinate the third world. And we can't breathe ca safely until everyone, everyone on the planet, has had the vac has had a chance at least to have a vaccination. Yeah. We're talking about boosters in some countries, and other countries have not even had first shots yet.